You're listening to The Recovered Life Show, the show that helps people in recovery live their best recovered lives. And here is your host, Damon Frank. And welcome back to The Recovered Life Show. I'm so pleased to have my guest, Jeff J. with us. Jeff works in the recovery field and is also an interventionist and also is about ready to have 43 years of sobriety. I had to have Jeff onto the show. I've been following his work for some time. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Thanks so much. I'm glad to be here. Oh, so thrilled to have you. You know, there's a bunch of stuff I wanted to talk with you about. And, you know, it's interesting because sometimes, Jeff, we say to ourselves, if we have long-term sobriety, or even sometimes if we have over five or 10 years of sobriety, we say, man, where's all the people that have long-term sobriety? And there's people probably going to meetings that have 10 years and say, man, I, no one has more than me, right? So, so to see somebody who is almost 43 years, 42 years of sobriety, that's a big deal. So I want to talk with you about that. And I also want to talk with you about the work that you do with families, because I think that's so important. The whole idea of just, if you stay sober long enough, Jeff, what's going to happen is some amazing things are going to happen, including healing for your family. So let's dive right into it. You know, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you get here? How did you get to 42 years of sobriety? And how did this all start? Well, it was a bit of a miracle because I had uh, decided to kill myself. I'd been uh, hitchhiking around the country trying to be the next Jack Kerouac for quite a while. Uh, you know, drinking and drugging like a madman and bouncing from city to town and town to city. Um and I won't go into a whole drunk log or anything, but it was it was down to the end. You know, I was I had a bleeding ulcer, a bleeding colon, neuropathy of the legs, and uh, and I was all of 26 years old. And I, I just couldn't I couldn't hack it anymore. And I heard that a friend of mine had committed suicide, and I thought, well, sounds like a good idea to me. And I'm I don't want to go into too long of a story, but a series of little miracles or coincidences took place that were insanely unlikely and um, which ended up in a little family intervention. I had bounced back out to San Francisco again because all the beat poets and Kerouac and all those guys hung out in North Beach, right? You know, so I'm, you know, in a flop house and, um, you know, $7 a night, my kind of place. And, uh, and like I say, I would planned to kill myself. I was going to do it in the same way my friend was going to. And a, um, a friend of my brother's happened to be vacationing, happened to be in San Francisco, saw me, didn't talk to me, saw what kind of condition I was in, called my parents and said, you got to find him. This is the address of where he went into. You got to find him. He's going to die like right now. And it's it's kind of a long story i, I won't go into it uh, a whole lot more but they've they got a phone number for a pay phone in the basement you know and i'm like and they you know called me and i you know had been going to kill myself but i gave myself a one man going away party so i you know didn't make it and um you know i, I pick up the phone this pay phone you know hello and it's my father i haven't talked to him and i the last i talked to him i was in chicago you know, how, how could this be? This is 1981. Okay. And I'm like, I can't talk to you. And I hung up and I got a little pint of port and I went across the street to Washington square park. And I just started sitting in the grass drinking. And I knew I had to call them back because, you know, there was going to be police. There was going to, something was going to happen. I knew it. And, uh, and I just sat there in the grass like a fool, eight 30 in the morning drinking while the, People are doing Tai Chi over here. The other people are going to Montgomery Street to the financial, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there in the, you know, and I'm like, I'm going to kill myself. Went and called home and they had talked to, my mom and dad had talked to a, a physician who knew something about intervention somehow. And uh, so they were very calm, very nice, very everything. And believe me, we didn't have very many calm conversations in that year of my life. And, um, Anyway, to make a long story short, all of a sudden, you know, my uh, I talked to my mom for a minute, and then I talked to my dad. He goes, Jeff, how are you doing? And all of a sudden, I 
I couldn't talk. I was just like, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? The thoughts going through my head. And I'm like, well, uh, I can hardly walk. I am bleeding from both ends and I'm going to kill myself in about, oh, I don't know, 10 minutes because I'm all ready to do it. Uh, but the sun is shining, the birds singing. Yes, in North Beach, even the sun is shining. And uh, and I said the most intelligent thing I've ever said in my life, which was, I think I need to go into a hospital. I don't know where it came from. The next thing you know, I knew, I was in the hospital. You know, it's funny because I know Washington Square Park well. I actually got sober and drank in San Francisco. Okay. So I know exactly the block that you're talking about. And Kevin yeah. O'Malley, who comes on the show a lot. Got sober right I got, there. I got well. that little pint at Coit Liquors. <laughs> there must be something that's happening in Washington Square Park. It must be the Italian food, something, the garlic, something. I don't right. know, something. St. Peter you know and Paul Cathedral. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, right. yeah. You know what's interesting, though, is that um, I had a similar situation in my 20s where I just had lost all hope. And I think it's hard for people to understand who aren't alcoholics how people seemingly could have everything going for them, you know mm. what I mean? Could yeah. literally drink themselves to death, right? It, right. Th and, and then have this sense of hopelessness and not really be able to see a way out. And that right. is so alcoholism, right? Like not really seeing, you know, I even remember towards the very, very, very end of it is I really thought I was going to be able to figure out a way to be able to drink normally Whatever that was to me, I have no interest in even drinking normally now. You know, three decades later, I have no interest in ever drinking normally. I don't know where that came from. But yeah. you know what I'm saying? Like this whole idea of this hopelessness that only alcoholics seem to really have and not really see the solution. We don't uh, we don't appreciate how how malnourished the brain is, among many other things. We have the dynamics of addiction. We can talk about the neuroscience and yeah. stuff. But the other thing that happens is that you're not sleeping right. You're not eating right. Your your brain is very malnourished. You're pouring all kinds of chemicals on it all the time. And we're making we're asking this brain to make better decisions. It's not going to happen. Yeah, we just don't see it. You know, it's interesting yeah. this phenomenon of craving too that kicks in. If you want to talk a little bit about that, that you had this moment of clarity because I had that too. And I think it's so special mm -hmm. really to look back. And I, a lot of the times, you know, I don't take that for granted, like that mm -hmm. not everybody has that and can act on it. Mm -hmm. it. It is actually the more I've been in recovery and the more I just meet other people that are recovered who have had that as well. It is a really, well, I guess they would call it now a God shot moment, right? Like, can you mm -hmm. talk about that a little bit when you finally decided it's like, okay, man, I need some help. What, what happens? Yeah. Then? I think, you know, in some ways, the, the immediate precursor to that was I stopped talking. So I was able to listen somehow for about, you know, four tenths of a second or something like that and, and realize that people who loved me were trying to get to me. I mean, look, that had happened before, you know, girlfriends, even my cocaine dealer tried to get me to go to treatment. You know, I mean, it was just crazy. But in that moment, I was so low and yet someone reached out, you know, they were trying to get to me, they were trying to save me and, and I could feel uh, the love and concern. And that's what's so important is that in that moment, I knew it was authentic and I knew that I was out of answers or whatever answers I had were BS. And that's another important thing is just having enough humility to finally call BS on yourself. You yeah, know, because, absolutely. Because when we're drinking and drugging, I mean, we're like the kings of, of lying, right? I mean, we lie on autopilot. And uh, so there has to be just a moment of, of acceptance of that, that the reality is I'm not okay. Despite yeah. what, I think, despite exactly. what I'm telling everybody, you know, uh, I'm not okay. You and, know, yeah. what what do you think? What do you think? You know, when you did that, you 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 have this. Okay, I'm not okay. I need help, and obviously, you get into recovery. You get into a hospital. You get there. I would love to talk about the family because I know you work yeah. as an interventionist, sure, in, in the recovery in in the recovery field. 
You know, this whole idea about how you were talking about confrontational relationships with your family, about yeah. how things were maybe very blunt or very not necessarily communicating lovingly to people. Right. You know, I know when I first got into recovery, it was very, this is the last house on the block. Take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. We don't give a crap what you think. Like, you know what? You're going to do it exactly this way. And I've seen the recovery business change a lot. And even my opinion, uh, my approach, even even if it's in a 12 step group, working with somebody has changed a little bit because one, it's not the last house on the block always Two, It's like, you know, I think you have to extend yourself in a way that you're loving and kind. Yes, you have to be direct. Yes, mm -hmm. you have to be honest. Yes, you have to be all those other things. But could you talk about that a little bit? Because I think sure. a lot of times with this Al-Anon culture of that's it, I'm cutting them off. They relapsed one time. That's the end. I'm never speaking with that. Right. It is yeah. just really not the path I think to healing. No, none of that works. And that's not even an authentic Al-Anon path. Uh, what you just described. Um, no, it's the love and concern of the most important people in your life that has the best chance of getting through to you. And it's all about the love and concern. And I and I think it's helpful to medicalize it, to say, you know, we're looking at this not as a, a character problem or a moral problem or a willpower problem. It's a medical problem. And you need, you know, and you need some help. And and it's not judgmental. And it's also part and parcel of it is saying, and we're going to walk this walk with you. You know, you're going to get into your recovery. We're going to get into our recovery. We're going to do this together. And so there is the that the beginnings of a recovery team if you will instead of being you know how can we get them to stop drinking how can we get them to stop drugging what can we, you know what kind of beatings can we bring down on this person to kind of knock some sense into them and listen sometimes you have to let the natural consequences take place i mean i'm not saying that that isn't you know you don't want to just enable open checkbook you know but the love and concern of family members and friends when it's done, you know, in a specific and organized way, you can really use that power of love to break through a person's defenses and denial, not 100% of the time, but you can change the kind of conversation that you're having and, um, and make it really important that uh, they understand that that you're with them. Again, not to not to necessarily write them a blank check for their their rent this month, but uh, to get them the help that they need. Yeah. And I think, you know, we talk a lot in recovery, especially emotional recovery, Jeff, about this all or nothing black and white thinking that alcoholics tend to have. And right. I think it's the same thing with the family. This black and white thinking all or nothing doesn't work well either. And I've seen it in my own family of that people will eventually get there Hopefully, you know, you're hoping that they eventually get there, but yeah. this constant beating of them up constantly, you know, and you have to have boundaries, you have to have healthy boundaries, of course, but you know, this constant, it's just not an effective strategy. So let's, right. you know, and there's, it's a, just there's not, a way to do it. So it, my wife, Deborah and I are the authors of a book called love first, which is the Hazelden's big book on intervention. And the way you do bottom lines now, which is kind of what you're talking about, is you don't say, you know, and if you don't go to treatment, you know, you're we're gonna, no more money and no more this, no more that. Instead, what a bottom line letter, a second letter, uh, you know, I'm jumping way ahead here, but the way you really do it is to say, you know, dear Jeff, I realize now that, you know, I owe you an apology. I've been giving you money for this and paying for your car and doing this and doing all these things. And I realized that instead of helping you, I've really been hurting you. And I'm really sorry. And I'm not going to hurt you anymore. You know, I understand that today you're saying you can't go. And, and, you know, that's, you know, I hope you'll make a different decision down the road. But for right now, I'm going to start going to Al-Anon. We're going to start doing structured family recovery. I'm going to start, you know, doing what I can do and, and do better. And, uh, you know, I hope before you make a final decision, you'll think twice about it and, you know, maybe maybe accept some help today. So it's very important the way you're doing that. You're, you're starting off by really apologizing and saying, you know, I've got a, a deeper understanding of what I've been doing now. And it wasn't helpful. 
and uh, and I'm all about helping you because I love you. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people don't, you know, for me, I know when I had walked in old in my mid 20s in a, to to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, I really didn't know what the problem was. Sincerely, right. I, I knew it had something to do with alcohol. <clears throat> that, but if only I could control my drinking, I really didn't know what an alcoholic was. And I know this sounds very ignorant, but I'd never met a recovered alcoholic. I came from a family right. that drank a lot, you know, everyone around. I like, I did not know that that was a thing, you know, and not until people started asking me questions like, well, Damon, what do you think is really going on with you? If it's not alcohol, if it's not this medical condition of alcoholism, if it's not the phenomenon of craving, if you're not any of these things, well, what is it? Mm -hmm. You know, in a non-judgmental way, they were saying that. And I really couldn't answer that after right. I ran through people, places and things. And I really kind of knew deep down inside that didn't resonate a lot. What do you think that spark is, Jeff? Well, you know, when I was really very start fortunate. I was very fortunate because I, I went to detox and this, you know, the second or third day, this doc came in to talk to me and he was like God himself coming into the room. It was a great, big, powerful black man. It was like James Earl Jones in his prime, you know, with a white coat and a stethoscope. And he'd been doing alcohol and drug treatment for like 30 years. So, and I'm like this kid, I'm shaking and sweating, you know, and he got right up in my face and he goes, boy. And I'm like, geez, geez. boy, you got a disease. He said, you're not responsible for what you've done. And I'm like, great, you know? And he said, but you're responsible for what you do now. And I'm like, Shh, I probably can't say that. He said, your disease is incurable. The most we're gonna be able to do is put it in remission. We're gonna give you a program to follow, 12 steps. You follow that program, the disease will stay in remission. You stop following that program and the disease is gonna kick you in the ass again. And he stood up and he walked out. Damon, I didn't have any idea what he was talking about, okay? But he planted that first seed, again, in a kind of a non-judgmental way that, you know, you've actually got a medical problem, you know, and there's a way out. We're gonna lay it out for you. We're gonna help you to get on this path and we can help put it in remission we can't cure it but we can put it in remission and help you keep it in remission and everything i heard in the days weeks and months that followed was congruent with that message and and the longer i went the more sense it made it may it, it makes total sense you know it's interesting all the people that lead up that really tell you hey you might have a problem the doctor who sees you and says, hey, you know, this isn't, this isn't good. Alcohol is doing this to you. And you just kind of bury it mm -hmm. as an alcoholic. I found came back after I started to get sober. And those things started to come back, which, which tells me that any kind of service that we do to somebody else who's suffering as an alcoholic is not wasted if they decide not to get sober at that moment. It I've seen that it comes back. I remember things. The people were telling me five or six years before I got sober. That's you know, right. Like this isn't, this is, th there's a better way to do this. Right. And it, and it, and it did, it, it added to like a bank and mm -hmm. it built up and it got me to a place where I was able to see it myself. Yes. Yes. I was fortunate in that I was, you know, my, my illness had really destroyed me and I had nothing left. And so, um, it was, um, it was a little simpler for me uh, to admit that uh, that I was pretty washed up. Yeah, I you know, it's it's interesting and I would love to hear your I would love to hear your perspective where you go from literally in a hospital bed to now, you know, 42 years later, you're writing books, they're getting published, you're helping people get sober, you're intervening mm -hmm. in the same situations that you once were in. How yeah. did that all happen? Like, did that, you know, did you just wake up one day and say, you know, this is it? I'm going to dedicate my life to this? I had uh, been working in a regular job for about five years, in the first five years of my recovery. And I decided I wanted to become a counselor. And 
stop making money, basically, because back in that time, nobody made any money in the recovery field, <laughs> believe it or not. Uh, and uh, so I, um, I, I, I did. I, I knew uh, the guy who was running a place called Sacred Heart Rehabilitation Center here in Detroit and, and up in a little town called Memphis, Michigan, where we had a long term residential program. And um, I got to learn from the best and uh, became an alcohol and drug counselor. And then after I was doing it for a while, I, I uh, went to Florida and uh, where I ultimately met my, my wife, Deborah. I was nine years sober at that time and, and got a job working for Hazelden. Uh, they had a program in West Palm at that time called Hanley Hazelden. And uh, so we were both counselors. We always uh, make it a point that we weren't patients when we met at Hazelden. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's, and then kind of, we together decided that, you know, at that time, early nineties, intervention was all but unknown. Uh, there was Vern Johnson, but he had never really put anything together in a systematic way. And we decided we wanted to make a difference. And, um, you know, we kind of brought the idea to Hazelden and they went along with it and they weren't part of, you know, they hadn't merged with Betty Ford yet. And we got them involved and we got some other people involved and uh, and did a big project and then uh, books followed from that and uh, it's kind of a long story but it happened uh, you know gradually over you know uh 10 plus years uh basically and um and you know continuing to to grow my own recovery and and go through a lot of hardship my father's death my brother's suicide uh, a breakup of a, a brief marriage that i had had early in recovery and uh, to a wonderful person. Um, but anyway, uh, so you go through a lot and you evolve and you grow and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's a lot to it. And now fast forward to uh, today, um, you know, there have been books, there has been a career, there have been, you know, a lot of things. And, uh, you know, if CNN calls me up and say, all right, okay, 11 o'clock. Okay, fine. <laughs> you know, but uh, where once upon a time it would have been, oh my God, can you imagine? That's great. So, that is so great. So, what do you think has changed? You know, Jeff, in your in the in the forty two almost forty three years of sobriety, what do you think has changed actually in the recovery treatment area? Do you see anything major happening? Because I hear from a lot of people who have time. It's like you know what nothing's changed and other people say, well, everything has changed. And I think it's somewhat in the middle there. What, what, what's your, what's your experience with that? On the professional side, there have been tremendous changes, most of which I, I don't love. Um, we don't agree anymore on a professional level, what the goal of treatment should be. It used to be pretty straightforward. We want to help people get clean and sober. That's no longer the case. You're, you're just as likely to come out on more mood altering drugs than you went in on. And I'm not talking about that's not necessarily, you know, yeah. a knock against like medication assisted treatment, which is what people might think I'm referring to, because some people do well with Suboxone, let's say. Yeah. But just today I had somebody, you know, they went in to get off benzos, you know, they're doing Xanax. And now he comes out and he's so happy. I'm clean yep. and sober, blah, blah, blah. And they just had me on Ativan. And I'm like, what? Yeah. What are you talking about? That's, you know, I didn't, I had to like not say anything, but I mean, it's like, that's another benzo. But there's somebody who's rationalizing why that's a good idea. And I'm sure if he has a little brain fog, they'll say, well, we can fix that with a little Adderall. And by the way, you know, I mean, marijuana is legal. So maybe you'll get a little lift out of that. And so there is uh, an idea somehow that um, we can fix it all with pharmaceuticals and some deep counseling to find out, you know, what the etiology of your particular addiction was, which is always going to be, uh, you know, something back in your past, which isn't necessarily the case because there's genetics and other things. So, um, there have been a lot of things that have changed and uh but the biggest one is we we don't necessarily agree what the goal of treatment is yes yes that is so interesting because i've seen this really hurt a lot of people and i'm you know um i i like you know i think medications are amazing and i think that they help a lot and you know and and you know the the flip side of this too is jeff i hear from a lot of people who are early in recovery 
that will go into a 12 step program and say, I, I don't want the Bill and Bob experience. I don't want to be a depressive in, you know, in, in, in recovery. I don't want this. I don't, I don't want the life that they're talking about. So you have this whole TikTok, TikTok sobriety thing. And I, yeah. and I think some of it is there's some, there's, there's a, there seems to be a, a, a misconception about what is an alcoholic. A lot of the times there's a lot of people who get addicted to things, but aren't necessarily alcoholics, you know? And there's a lot of people who have maybe used a substance because there was something else going on with them, some sort of other psychiatric disorder that was going on with them, but they're not necessarily alcoholics. They were addicted for a period of time. They drop it. They move on with their life. That's not an alcoholic. Like an alcoholic drops right. it. That's when the problems begin is when you take away alcohol from, from an alcoholic. Well, yeah. And there, I mean, you've actually just brought up a whole bunch of things. And um, I think, you know, the, 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 one point that sticks out people will say well i don't want the the bill and bob experience and but i'll tell you just like i was referencing earlier if you if you live long enough you will go through some very difficult things in life you will experience anxiety and depression and stuff like that and so the question is how are you going to deal with it what i found is that having a community around me is the best way to deal with it because life is difficult. The acceptance of that fact is, you know, that's the first noble truth of Buddhism, you know. Uh, so these things happen. Life is difficult. It is challenging. And we can't escape that by saying, well, I don't want to have that experience. You will. You will experience yeah. tremendous losses in your life. Believe me. I mean, if you're alive, you will. And, um, and very challenging emotional situations. So there there's no escape from that the other thing is um i think that we uh, one thing that i've seen come and go and come and go and it's come again is that we're kind of overly psychologizing addictive disorders um and and wanting to link everything in the world to trauma and without undercutting the importance of dealing with trauma or adverse experiences in your life, you have to realize that that's not a cure for addiction if you do that. And it's very unlikely that you will have the ego strength to face those things in very early recovery. So treatment plans that revolve around trauma, I think are likely to do more harm than good uh, because the person is the brain, emotionally, ego strength, everything is just not there yet. You've got to get a foundation that you can work from and then maybe go back and start looking at some of that stuff. But if you're not already, um, if, if you don't already have a good foundation in recovery, you will not find it by going into the most difficult things that you've ever experienced. I agree. And I think, you know, there is so much effort right now to make people not feel uncomfortable. And, you know, I've yeah. said a lot of times, it's like, you know, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we, yeah. we don't want you to feel uncomfortable for any stretch of the, you know, any period of time. And I'm yeah. like, well, you know what? I, I don't know if that's really a good idea because really, yeah. why wouldn't you be uncomfortable if alcohol was your best friend, drugs were your best friend, and now you don't have them and you don't have a lot of coping mechanisms besides that. Why wouldn't you feel uncomfortable? Feeling uncomfortable would be a normal response, I would think. To, Absolutely. To, to that. And, it's not an yeah. abnormal response. The old wisdom from the most resilient uh, generations is that, you know, emotions are just emotions. They pass. You know, if you're feeling bad, if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling anxious, if you're feeling uncomfortable, it's really kind of okay because that's not who you are. You know, it's an emotion. You're experiencing it. It's going to pass. It wasn't here three hours ago. It won't be here, you know. So, and so, but a lot of times we focus, oh, why are you uncomfortable? We got to get to the bottom of that. Really? Maybe not. Maybe what we have to do is get me to a place. Let's go back to young Jeff J, 26 years old. He's been sober for 14 and a half minutes. And he can walk into a group of people and say, you know what? I don't even know if I want to stay sober. You know what I mean? And I might drink tomorrow. I just don't care. I don't care about anything. I don't care about the job. I don't care about this. I don't care about that, blah, blah, blah. And they're all like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I can actually say this to these people and they don't lose it. 
they actually know what I'm talking about. And all of a sudden, what, what happens? I get comfortable. I get comfortable. I didn't take a drug. I didn't get high. I start laughing too, because they tell some wacky thing, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. I thought that guy was not like me at all. He is. Look at that woman. She's like a school teacher and she's got the same crazy going on. It's hilarious. And so it's a more holistic, organic way to, you know, regain control of those disordered emotions and allow my authentic self to come forward. So that's that's where I think the strength of you know, recovery programs, and for me, particularly 12 step recovery programs um, are really amazing. And, you know, I mean, for most people, they are optimal if you're going for the long term. It's not the only way, but it's, you know, for the majority of people, if you're looking at people who are, you know, three, three years, five years and better, they're probably going to be involved in a program. And like it's that. the easiest way to be honest. Like when people ask me, what is the easiest way to do this? That is the yeah. easiest way to do it. It really is. It's like, yeah, yeah, you can go try to find something else, but it's already built in. It's already has a system, what I call spiritual technology. That's already there that you could tap into in yeah. which to, in, in which to get the life that you want in sobriety. Final thoughts, Jeff, if somebody's out there listening and say, man, it's pretty easy, you know, obviously he has 42, almost 43 years here. Jeff can do it, but I just don't know. I just don't know if I have it in me to get and stay sober. What would be you your are message? Correct. To them? You don't, you know, you absolutely don't. And that's okay. I don't either. And I never did, you know, but I got in with a group of people who did. And I found out that, you know, sticking with the big eye alone on the couch with the clicker or the screen or whatever, you know, I mean, I'm just not going to make it. But if I can get to the we, if I can get to the people who actually have done this, they will carry me along. They will do for me what I cannot do for myself. That's so all I have to do is is get to get to where the help is. And I don't have to believe it's going to work. All I have to do is hold it together for the rest of the day. I don't even have to make a commitment to tomorrow. OK, that's yes. how easy it is. All I have to do is like right now, just, you know, like take a bus, take a bike, walk, drive. I don't care. Just get to where these people are and just let it all hang out. Yeah. I always say it doesn't matter what you feel. It's what you do, especially in early recovery, right? It's actually showing up and doing the deal. Jeff J, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Guys, we're going to put links to those books that we were talking about, how to get a hold of Jeff in all of the show notes and at Recovered Life TV. Jeff, thanks so much for coming on. We're going to have you back for another episode. Thank you so much it's for coming on. It's a pleasure. On. Thank you, Damon. Hey, if you like this episode, think about supporting us by becoming a Recovered Life Plus member. At Recovered Life TV, we're not just delivering premium recovery resources. We're empowering you with the knowledge and tools that make a real difference in the quality of your recovery. By subscribing, you gain access to ad-free content, expert insights, exclusive video and audio segments, special projects, plus so much more, all while supporting our mission to spread the recovery message far and wide. Whether you're seeking to deepen your understanding or stay updated on the latest addiction and mental health recovery trends, Recovered Life Plus is for you. Subscribe now and start living your best recovered life. Just go to recoveredlife.tv and become a Plus member today.